Sing a Song of Sixpence by Agatha Christie. Sir Edward Palliser, KC, lived at number nine, Queen Anne's Close. Queen Anne's Close is a cul-de-sac. In the very heart of Westminster, it manages to have a peaceful old world atmosphere, far removed from the turmoil of the 20th century. It suited Sir Edward Palliser admirably. Sir Edward had been one of the most eminent criminal barristers of his day, and now that he no longer practised at the bar, he had amused himself by amassing a very fine criminological library. He was also the author of a volume of reminiscences of eminent criminals. On this particular evening, Sir Edward was sitting in front of his library fire, sipping some very excellent black coffee and shaking his head over a volume of Lombroso, such ingenious theories, and so completely out of date. The door opened almost noiselessly, and his well-trained manservant approached over the thick pile carpet and murmured discreetly, "'A young lady wishes to see you, sir. A young lady?' Sir Edward was surprised. Here was something quite out of the usual course of events, though he reflected that it might be his niece, Ethel, but no, in that case, Armour would have said so. He inquired cautiously. The lady did not give her name. No, sir, but she said she was quite sure you would wish to see her. Show her in, said Sir Edward Palliser. He felt pleasurably intrigued. A tall, dark girl of close on thirty, wearing a black coat and skirt, well cut, and a little black hat, came to Sir Edward with outstretched hand and a look of eager recognition on her face. Armour withdrew, closing the door noiselessly behind him. Sir Edward, you do know me, don't you? I'm Magdalene Vaughan. Why, of course, he pressed the outstretched hand warmly. He remembered her perfectly now. That trip home from America on the Siluric. This charming child, for she had been little more than a child. He had made love to her, he remembered, in a discreet, elderly, man-of-the-world fashion. She had been so adorably young, so eager, so full of admiration and hero-worship, just made to captivate the heart of a man nearing sixty. The remembrance brought additional warmth into the pressure of his hand. This is most delightful of you. Sit down, won't you? He arranged an armchair for her, talking easily and evenly, wondering all the time why she had come. When at last he brought the easy flow of small talk to an end, there was silence. Her hand closed and unclosed on the arm of the chair. She moistened her lips. Suddenly she spoke, abruptly. Sir Edward, I want you to help me. He was surprised and murmured mechanically, yes. She went on, speaking more intensely. You said that if I ever needed help, that if there was anything in the world you could do for me, you would do it. Yes, he had said that. It was the sort of thing one did say, particularly at the moment of parting. He could recall the break in his voice, the way he had raised her hand to his lips. If there is anything I can do, remember, I mean it. Yes, one said that sort of thing. But very, very rarely did one have to fulfil one's words. And certainly not after, how many, nine or ten years? He flashed a quick glance at her. She was still a very good-looking girl, but she had lost what had been to him her charm, that look of dewy, untouched youth. It was a more interesting face now, perhaps. A younger man might have thought so. But Sir Edward was far from feeling the tide of warmth and emotion that had been his at the end of that Atlantic voyage. His face became legal and cautious. He said in rather a brisk way, uh, "'Certainly, my dear young lady,' I shall be delighted to do anything in my power, though I doubt if I can be very helpful to anyone in these days. If he was preparing his way of retreat, she did not notice it. She was of the type that can only see one thing at a time, and what she was seeing at this moment was her own need. She took Sir Edward's willingness to help for granted. We are in terrible trouble, Sir Edward. 
We? Uh, you're married? No, I meant my brother and I. Oh, and William and Emily, too, for that matter. But I must explain. I have, uh, I had, an aunt, Miss Crabtree. You may have read about her in the papers. It was horrible. She was killed. Murdered. Ah, a flash of interest lit up Sir Edward's face. About a month ago, wasn't it? The girl nodded. Uh, rather less than that. Uh, three weeks. Yes, I remember. Um, she was hit on the head in her own house, though they didn't get the fellow who did it. Again, Magdalen Vaughan nodded. They didn't get the man. I don't believe they ever will get the man. You see, there mightn't be any man to get. What? Yes, it's awful. Nothing's come out about it in the papers, but that's what the police think. They know nobody came to the house that night. You mean that it's one of us four? It must be. They don't know which, and, and, and we don't know which. We don't know. And we sit there every day looking at each other surreptitiously and wondering. Oh, if only it could have been someone from outside. But I don't see how it can. Sir Edward stared at her, his interest arising. You mean that the members of the family are under suspicion? Yes, that's what I mean. The police haven't said so, of course. They've been quite polite and nice. But they've ransacked the house. They've questioned us all. And Martha, again and again. And because they don't know which, they're holding their hand. I'm so frightened. So horribly frightened. My dear child, come now. Surely you're exaggerating. I'm not. It's one of us four. It must be. Who are the four to whom you refer? Magdalene sat up straight and spoke more composedly. There's myself and Matthew. Aunt Lily was our great-aunt. Uh, she was my grandmother's sister. We've lived with her ever since we were fourteen. Uh, we're twins, you know. Then uh, there was William Crabtree. He was her nephew, her brother's child. He lived there too with his wife Emily. She supported them. More or less. He has a little money of his own, but he's not strong and has to live at home. He's a quiet, dreamy sort of man. I'm sure it would have been impossible for him to have... Oh, it's awful of me even to think of it, even. I'm still very far from understanding the position. Perhaps you would not mind running over the facts, if it does not distress you too much. Oh, oh no, I want to tell you. And it's all quite clear in my mind still horribly clear. We'd had tea, you understand, and we'd all gone off to do things of our own. I to do some dressmaking, Matthew to type an article, he does a little journalism, William to do his stamps. Emily hadn't been down to tea. She'd taken a headache powder and was lying down. So there we were, all of us, busy and occupied. And when Martha went in to lay supper at half past seven, there Aunt Lily was, dead. Her head... Oh, it's horrible. All crushed in. The weapon was found, I think. Yes, it was a heavy paperweight that always lay on the table by the door. The police tested it for fingerprints, but there were none. It had been wiped clean. And your first surmise? We thought, of course, it was a burglar. There were two or three drawers of the bureau pulled out, as though a thief had been looking for something. Of course we thought it was a burglar. And then the police came and they said she'd been dead at least an hour, and asked Martha who had been to the house, and, and Martha said nobody, and all the windows were fastened on the inside, and there seemed no signs of anything having been tampered with. And then they began to ask us questions. She stopped, her breast heaved. Her eyes, frightened and imploring, sought Sir Edward's in search of reassurance. For instance, who benefited by your aunt's death? That's simple, we all benefit equally. She left her money to be divided in equal shares among the four of us. And what was the value of her estate? The lawyer told us it'll come to about £80,000 after the death duties are paid. Sir Edward opened his eyes in some slight surprise. That is quite a considerable sum. You knew, I suppose, the total of your aunt's fortune? Magdalen shook her head. No, it came quite as a surprise to us. Aunt Lily was always terribly careful about money. She kept just the one servant and always talked a lot about economy. Sir Edward nodded thoughtfully. 
Magdalene leaned forward a little in her chair. You will help me? You will? Her words came to Sir Edward as an unpleasant shock, just at the moment when he was becoming interested in her story for its own sake. My dear young lady, what can I possibly do? If you want good legal advice, I can give you the name. She interrupted him. Oh, I don't want that sort of thing. I want you to help me personally, as a friend. That's very charming of you, but I want you to come to our house. I want you to ask questions. I want you to see and judge for yourself. But, my dear young, remember, you promised. Anywhere, any time, you said, if I wanted help. Her eyes, pleading yet confident, looked into his. He felt ashamed and strangely touched. That terrific sincerity of hers, that absolute belief in an idle promise ten years old as a sacred binding thing. How many men had not said those selfsame words, a cliché almost, and how few of them had ever been called upon to make good? He said rather weakly, I, I'm sure there are many people who could advise you better than I could. I've got lots of friends, naturally. He was amused by the naive self-assurance of that. But you see, none of them are clever, not like you. You're used to questioning people, and with all your experience you must know. Know what? Whether they're innocent or guilty. He smiled rather grimly to himself. He flattered himself that on the whole he usually had known though on many occasions his private opinion had not been that of the jury. Magdalene pushed back her hat from her forehead with a nervous gesture, looked round the room and said, How quiet it is here! Don't you sometimes long for some noise? The cul-de-sac! All unwittingly her words, spoken at random, touched him on the roar. A cul-de-sac! Yes, but there was always a way out, the way you had come the way back into the world. Something impetuous and youthful stirred in him. Her simple trust appealed to the best side of his nature, and the condition of her problem appealed to something else, the innate criminologist in him. He wanted to see these people of whom she spoke. He wanted to form his own judgment. He said, If you are really convinced I can be of any use, mind, I guarantee nothing. He expected her to be overwhelmed with delight, but she took it very calmly. I knew you'd do it. I've always thought of you as a real friend. Will you come back with me now? No, I think if I pay you a visit tomorrow it will be more satisfactory. Will you give me the name and address of Miss Crabtree's lawyer? I may want to ask him a few questions. She wrote it down and handed it to him. Then she got up and said rather shyly, I, I, I'm really most awfully grateful. Goodbye. And your own address? Uh, how stupid of me. 18 Palatine Walk, Chelsea. It was three o'clock on the following afternoon when Sir Edward Palliser approached 18 Palatine Walk with a sober, measured tread. In the interval, he had found out several things. He had paid a visit that morning to Scotland Yard, where the assistant commissioner was an old friend of his, and he had also had an interview with the late Miss Crabtree's lawyer. As a result, he had a clearer vision of the circumstances. Miss Crabtree's arrangements in regard to money had been somewhat peculiar. She never made use of a cheque-book. Instead, she was in the habit of writing to her lawyer and asking him to have a certain sum in five-pound notes waiting for her. It was nearly always the same sum, three hundred pounds four times a year. She came to fetch it herself in a four-wheeler, which she regarded as the only safe means of conveyance. At other times she never left the house. At Scotland Yard Sir Edward learned that the question of finance had been gone into very carefully. Miss Crabtree had been almost due for her next instalment of money. Presumably the previous three hundred had been spent, or almost spent, but this was exactly the point that had not been easy to ascertain. By checking the household expenditure, it was soon evident that Miss Crabtree's expenditure per quarter fell a good deal short of the three hundred. On the other hand, she was in the habit of sending five-pound notes away to needy friends or relatives. 
Whether there had been much or little money in the house at the time of her death was a debatable point. None had been found. It was this particular point which Sir Edward was revolving in his mind as he approached Palatine Walk. The door of the house, which was a non-basement one, was opened to him by a small elderly woman with an alert gaze. He was shown into a big double room on the left of the small hallway, and there Magdalen came to him. More clearly than before, he saw the traces of nervous strain in her face. "'You told me to ask questions, and I have come to do so,' said Sir Edward, smiling as he shook hands. First of all, I want to know who last saw your aunt, and exactly what time it was. Uh, it was after tea, uh, five o'clock. Martha was the last person with her. She had been paying the books that afternoon and brought Aunt Lily the change in the accounts. You trust Martha? Oh, absolutely. She was with Aunt Lily for, oh, thirty years, I suppose. She's as honest as the day. Sir Edward nodded. Another question. Why did your cousin, Mrs. Crabtree, take a headache powder? Well, because she had a headache. Naturally. But was there any particular reason why she should have a headache? Well, yes, in a way. There was rather a scene at lunch. Emily is very excitable and highly strung. She and Aunt Lily used to have rows sometimes. And they had one at lunch? Yes. Aunt Lily was rather trying about little things. It all started out of nothing, and then they were at it hammer and tongs, with Emily saying all sorts of things she couldn't possibly have meant, and that she'd leave the house and never come back, that she was grudged every mouthful she ate, oh, all sorts of silly things. And Aunt Lily said the sooner she and her husband packed their boxes and went, the better. But it all meant nothing, really because Mr. and Mrs. Crabtree couldn't afford to pack up and go. Oh, not only that, William was fond of Aunt Emily. He really was. It wasn't a day of quarrels by any chance. Magdalen's colour heightened. You mean me? The fuss about me wanting to be a mannequin. Your aunt wouldn't agree. No. Why did you want to be a mannequin, Miss Magdalen? Does the life strike you as a very attractive one? No, but anything would be better than going on living here. Yes, then, but now you'll have a very comfortable income, won't you? Oh, oh yes, it's quite different now. She made the admission with the utmost simplicity. He smiled but pursued the object no further. Instead, he said, And your brother? Did he ever quarrel too? Matthew? Oh, no. Then no one can say he had a motive for wishing his aunt out of the way? He was quick to seize on the momentary dismay that showed in her face. "'I forgot,' he said casually. "'He owed a great deal of money, didn't he?' "'Yes, poor old Matthew.' "'Still, that will be all right now.' "'Yes,' she sighed. I "'It is a relief.' And still she saw nothing. He changed the subject hastily. "'Your cousins and your brother are at home?' "'Yes, I, I told them you were coming.' They're all so anxious to help. Oh, Sir Edward, I feel somehow that you are going to find out that everything is all right, that none of us had anything to do with it, that it, after all it was an outsider. I can't do miracles. I may be able to find out the truth, but I can't make the truth be what you want it to be. Can't you? I felt you could do anything. Anything. She left the room. He thought, disturbed. What did she mean by that? Does she want me to suggest a line of defence? For whom? His meditations were interrupted by the entrance of a man about fifty years of age. He had a naturally powerful frame, but stooped slightly. His clothes were untidy, and his hair carelessly brushed. He looked good-natured, but vague. Sir Edward Palliser, oh, how do you do? Magdalen sent me along. Uh, it's very good of you, I'm sure, to wish to help us, though I don't think anything will ever be really discovered. I mean, they won't catch the fellow. You think it was a burglar, then? Someone from outside? Well, it, it must have been. It couldn't be one of the family. These fellows are very clever nowadays. They climb like cats, and they get in and out as they like. Where were you, uh, Mr. Crabtree, when the tragedy occurred? 
I, I was busy with my stamps in my little sitting room upstairs. You didn't hear anything? No, but then I never do hear anything when I'm absorbed. Very foolish of me, but there it is. Is the sitting room you refer to over this room? No, it's in the back. Again the door opened. A small, fair woman entered. Her hands were twitching nervously. She looked fretful and excited. William, why didn't you wait for me? I, I said wait. Sorry, my dear, I, I forgot. Uh, Sir Edward Palliser, my wife. How do you do, Mrs. Crabtree? I hope you don't mind my coming here to ask a few questions. I know how anxious you must all be to have things cleared up. Naturally, but, but I can't tell you anything, can I, William? I was asleep, on my bed. I, I only woke up when Martha screamed. Her hands continued to twitch. Where is your room, uh, Mrs. Crabtree? It's over this, but, but I didn't hear anything. How could I? I was asleep. He could get nothing out of her but that. She knew nothing. She had heard nothing. She had been asleep. She reiterated it with the obstinacy of a frightened woman. Yet Sir Edward knew very well that it might easily be, probably was, the bare truth. He excused himself at last, said that he would like to put a few questions to Martha. William Crabtree volunteered to take him to the kitchen. In the hall, Sir Edward nearly collided with a tall, dark young man who was striding towards the front door. Mr. Matthew Vaughan? Yes, but look here, I can't wait. I've got an appointment. Matthew! It was his sister's voice from the stairs. Oh, Matthew, you promised. I know, sis, but I can't. Got to meet a fellow. And anyway, what's the good of talking about the damn thing over and over again? We've had enough of that with the police. I'm fed up with the whole show. The front door banged. Mr. Matthew Vaughan had made his exit. Sir Edward was introduced into the kitchen. Martha was ironing. She paused, iron in hand. Sir Edward shut the door behind him. Miss Vaughan has asked me to help her, he said. I hope you won't object to my asking you a few questions. She looked at him, then shook her head. None of them did it, sir. I know what you're thinking, but it isn't so. As nice a set of ladies and gentlemen as you could wish to see. I've no doubt of it, but their niceness isn't what we call evidence, you know. Perhaps not, sir. The law's a funny thing, but there is evidence, as you call it, sir. None of them could have done it without my knowing. But surely I know what I'm talking about, sir. There, listen to that. That was a creaking sound above their heads. The stairs, sir. Every time anyone goes up or down, the stairs creak something awful. It doesn't matter how quiet you go. Mrs. Crabtree, she was lying on her bed, and Mr. Crabtree was fiddling about with them wretched stamps of his, and Miss Magdalen, she was up above again working her machine. And if any of those three had come down the stairs, I would have known it, and they didn't. She spoke with a positive assurance which impressed the barrister. He thought, a good witness, she'll carry weight. You mightn't have noticed. Yes, I would. I'd have noticed without noticing, so to speak, like you notice when a door shuts and somebody goes out. Sir Edward shifted his ground. That is three of them accounted for, but there is a fourth. Was Mr. Matthew Vaughan upstairs also? No, but he was in the little room downstairs next door, and he was typewriting. You, you can hear it plain in here. His machine never stopped for a moment. Not for a moment, sir. I can swear to it. A nasty, irritating, tap-tapping noise it is too. Sir Edward paused a minute. It was you who found her, wasn't it? Yes, sir, it was. Lying there with blood on her poor hair and no one hearing a sound on account of the tap-tapping of Mr. Matthew's typewriter. I understand that you are positive that no one came into the house. How could they, sir, without my knowing? The bell rings in here and there's only the one door. He looked at her straight in the face. You were attached to Miss Crabtree. A warm glow, genuine, unmistakable, came into her face. Yes, indeed I was, sir. But for Miss Crabtree, well, I'm getting on and I don't mind speaking of it now. I got into trouble, sir, when I was a girl, and, and Miss Crabtree stood by me, took me back into her service, she did, when it was all over. I'd have died for her. I would indeed. Sir Edward knew sincerity when he heard it. Martha was sincere. And as far as you know, no one came to the door. No one could have come. 
I said, as far as you know. But if Miss Crabtree had been expecting someone, if she opened the door to that someone herself, oh, Martha seemed taken aback. That's possible, I suppose, Sir Edward urged. It's, it's possible, yes, but it isn't very likely. I mean, she was clearly taken aback. She couldn't deny, and yet she wanted to do so. Why? Because she knew that the truth lay elsewhere. Was that it? The four people in the house, one of them guilty. Did Martha want to shield that guilty party? Had the stairs creaked? Had someone come stealthily down? And did Martha know who that someone was? She herself was honest. Sir Edward was convinced of that. He pressed his point, watching her. Miss Crabtree might have done that, I suppose. The window of that room faces the street. She might have seen in whoever it was she was waiting for from the window and gone out into the hall and let him in, or her. She might even have wished that no one should see the person. Martha looked troubled, she said at last reluctantly. Yes, you may be right, sir. I never thought of that. That she was expecting a gentleman. Yes, it well might be. It was as though she began to perceive advantages in the idea. You were the last person to see her, were you not? Yes, sir. After I'd cleared away the tea, I took the receipted books to her and the change from the money she'd given me. Had she given you the money in five-pound notes? Five-pound notes, sir, said Martha in a shocked voice. The books never came up as high as five pounds. I'm very careful. Where did she keep the money? I don't rightly know, sir. I should say that she carried it about with her in her black velvet bag. But, of course, she may have kept it in one of the drawers in her bedroom that were locked. She was very fond of locking up things, though prone to lose her keys. Sir Edward nodded. You don't know how much money she had, in five-pound notes, I mean. No, sir, I, I couldn't say what the exact amount was. And she said nothing to you that could lead you to believe that she was expecting anybody? No, sir. You're quite sure. What exactly did she say? Well, Martha considered, she said the butcher was nothing more than a rogue and a cheat, and she said I'd had in a quarter of a pound of tea more than I ought, and she said Mrs Crabtree was full of nonsense for not liking to eat margarine, and she didn't like one of the sixpences I'd brought back, one of the new ones with oak leaves on it. She said it was bad, and I had a lot of trouble to convince her. And she said, oh, that the fishmonger had sent haddocks instead of whitings, and had I told him about it, and I said I had, and really, I think that's all, sir. Martha's speech had made the deceased lady loom clear to Sir Edward, as a detailed description would never have done. He said, casually, Rather a difficult mistress to please, eh? A, a bit fussy, but there, poor dear, she didn't often get out, and staying cooped up she had to have something to amuse herself like. She was pernickety but kind-hearted, never a beggar sent away from the door without something. Fussy she may have been, but a real charitable lady. I am glad, Martha, that she leaves one person to regret her. The old servant caught her breath. You mean... Oh, but they were all fond of her, really, underneath. They all had words with her now and again, but it didn't mean anything. Sir Edward lifted his head. There was a creak above. That's Miss Magdalen coming down. How do you know? he shot at her. The old woman flushed. I know a step, she muttered. Sir Edward left the kitchen rapidly. Martha had been right. Magdalen had just reached the bottom stair. She looked at him hopefully. Not very far on as yet, said Sir Edward, answering her look, and added, You don't happen to know what letters your aunt received on the day of her death? They're all together. The police have been through them, of course. She led the way to the big double drawing room, and unlocking a drawer, took out a large black velvet bag with an old-fashioned silver clasp. This is aunt's bag. Everything is in here just as it was on the day of her death. I've kept it like that. Sir Edward thanked her and proceeded to turn out the contents of the bag on the table. It was, he fancied, a fair specimen of an eccentric elderly lady's handbag. There was some odd silver change, two ginger nuts, 
three newspaper cuttings about Joanna Southcott's box, a trashy printed poem about the unemployed, an old Moore's almanac, a large piece of camphor, some spectacles and three letters, a spidery one from someone called Cousin Lucy, a bill for mending a watch, and an appeal from a charitable institution. Sir Edward went through everything very carefully, then repacked the bag and handed it to Magdalen with a sigh. Thank you, Miss Magdalen. I'm afraid there isn't much there. He rose, observed that from the window you commanded a good view of the front door steps, then took Magdalen's hand in his. You're going? Yes, but it's, it's going to be all right. Nobody connected with the law ever commits himself to a rash statement like that, said Sir Edward solemnly, and made his escape. He walked along the street, lost in thought. The puzzle was there, under his hand, and he had not solved it. It needed something, some little thing, just to point the way. A hand fell on his shoulder, and he started. It was Matthew Vaughan, somewhat out of breath. I've been chasing you, Sir Edward. I, I want to apologise for my rotten manners half an hour ago, but I've not got the best temper in the world, I'm afraid. It's awfully good of you to bother about this business. Uh, please ask me whatever you like, if there's anything I can do to help. Suddenly Sir Edward stiffened. His glance was fixed. Not on Matthew, but across the street. Somewhat bewildered, Matthew repeated, If there's anything I can do to help... You have already done it, my dear young man, said Sir Edward, by stopping me at this particular spot and so fixing my attention on something I might otherwise have missed. He pointed across the street to a small restaurant opposite. Four and twenty blackbirds, asked Matthew in a puzzled voice. Exactly. It's an odd name, but you get quite decent food there, I believe. I shall not take the risk of experimenting, said Sir Edward. Being further from my nursery days than you are, my young friend, I probably remember my nursery rhymes better. There is a classic that runs thus, if I remember rightly. Sing a song of sixpence, a pocket full of rye, four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie, and so on. The rest of it does not concern us. He wheeled round sharply. Where are you going? asked Matthew Vaughan. Back to your house, my friend. They walked there in silence, Matthew Vaughan shooting puzzled glances at his companion. Sir Edward entered, strode to a drawer, lifted out a velvet bag and opened it. He looked at Matthew, and the young man reluctantly left the room. Sir Edward tumbled out the silver change on the table. Then he nodded. His memory had not been at fault. He got up and rang the bell, slipping something into the palm of his hand as he did so. Martha answered the bell. You told me, Martha, if I remember rightly, that you had a slight altercation with your late mistress over one of the new sixpences. Yes, sir. Ah, but the curious thing is, Martha, that among this loose change... There is no new sixpence. There are two sixpences, but they are both old ones. She stared at him in a puzzled fashion. You see what that means. Someone did come to the house that evening. Someone to whom your mistress gave sixpence. I think she gave it him in exchange for this. With a swift movement he shot his hand forward, holding out the doggerel verse about unemployment. One glance at her face was enough. The game is up, Martha, you see, I know. You may as well tell me everything. She sank down on a chair. The tears raced down her face. It's true, it's true. The bell didn't ring properly. I wasn't sure, and then I thought I'd better go and see. I went to the door just as he struck her down. The roll of five-pound notes was on the table in front of her. It was the sight of them as made him do it. That and thinking she was alone in the house, as she'd let him in. I couldn't scream, I was too paralysed, and then he turned. And I saw it was my boy. Oh, he's been a bad one always. I gave him all the money I could. He's been in jail twice. 
he must have come round to see me. And then Miss Crabtree, seeing as I didn't answer the door, went to answer it herself. And he was taken aback and pulled out one of those unemployment leaflets. And the mistress, being kind of charitable, told him to come in and got out a sixpence. And all that time the roll of notes was lying on the table where it had been when I was giving her the change. And the devil got into my bed and he got behind her and struck her down. And then, asked Sir Edward, Oh, sir, what could I do? My own flesh and blood. His father was a bad un, and Ben takes after him. But he was my own son. I hustled him out and I went back to the kitchen and I went to lay for supper at the usual time. Do you think it was very wicked of me, sir? I tried to tell you no lies when you was asking me questions. Sir Edward rose. My poor woman, he said with feeling in his voice, I am very sorry for you. All the same, the law will have to take its course, you know. He's fled the country, sir. I don't know where he is. There's a chance, then, that he may escape the gallows, but don't build upon it. Will you send Miss Magdalen to me? Oh, Sir Edward, how wonderful of you! How wonderful you are, said Magdalen, when he had finished his brief recital. You saved us all. How can I ever thank you? Sir Edward smiled down at her and patted her hand gently. He was very much the great man. Little Magdalen had been very charming on the Siluric. That bloom of seventeen. Wonderful. She had completely lost it now, of course. The next time you need a friend, he said, I'll come straight to you. No, no, cried Sir Edward in alarm. That's just what I don't want you to do. Go to a younger man. He extricated himself with dexterity from the grateful household, and hailing a taxi, sank into it with a sigh of relief. Even the charm of a dewy seventeen seemed doubtful. It could not really compare with a really well-stocked library on criminology. The taxi turned into Queen Anne's close, his cul-de-sac. Hello, it's just Tony Walker here. I'm sure that you, like me, do not enjoy having your stories interrupted by advertisements. However, they are a necessary evil in keeping the podcast going. We need to pay the bills somehow. But there is a solution in that I can have an income and you can enjoy your podcasts ad-free with the joyous knowledge and the comfort and satisfaction of knowing that you're giving money directly to the creator, more or less. So if you go to Patreon, which is www.patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, dot com, forward slash, and my particular name is Barkid, so www.patreon.com, forward slash, B-A-R-C-U-D, that's me. And you get access to members-only stories, you get early access to the stories before they go out anywhere else, and you have a library of stories that you can download and they don't have any ads on them. How about that? So if you would consider doing that, please just nip along to Patreon, sign up, and, uh, and hopefully that provides the solution to not wanting your stories interrupted by ads. So that was Sing a Song of Sixpence, published in 1929 by Agatha Christie. So Agatha Christie, this is the second of her stories we've done on the Still Young Classic Detectives uh, Stories podcast. So she was born in England in 1819, died in 1976. She was an English crime novelist, short story writer and playwright. She's best known for her 66 detective novels and 14 short story collections, particularly those featuring her famous characters Hercule Poirot and Miss Marple. Christie is the best-selling novelist of all time, with her works having sold uh, over 2 billion copies. Listen to that, 2 billion copies worldwide. Her innovative plots, and she was very good at plotting, clever misdirection and surprising twists have earned her the title The Queen of Crime. 
So Sing a Song of Sixpence is a short story by Agatha Christie, first published in the December 1929 issue of Illustrated Sporting and Dramatic News in the UK. Um, I wonder who used to buy that. The story was later collected in the anthology The Listerdale Mystery, published in 1934, and published in the US in Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine in February 1947, and the collection The Witness for the Prosecution and Other Stories, 1948. So within Christie's extensive body of work, Sing a Song of Sixpence stands as an early example of her mastery of the short story format. Published in 29, it falls within the golden age of detective fiction in uh, Britain, a period characterised by puzzle-like mysteries, amateur sleuths and complex plots. While the story deviates from some of Christie's more famous works by featuring a one-off protagonist instead of her iconic detectives, it still showcases her ability to craft intricate and engaging mysteries. So I really liked the story, actually. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, There are a couple of things to say about it, but, um, you know, she is Agatha Christie. So... Be careful before you criticise her, because she is the best-selling novelist of all time. So that counts for a lot. Um, She's obviously got something. You don't sell that many books by not having something, you know. And she has. So what to say about the story? So first of all, it's very patrician, isn't it? So Edward Palliser, who was a KC, a King's Counsel. So they're like, uh, I have to explain this to people who don't. And it's the English. Scotland's different. England and Wales, I think, go together. So um, what you have is two kinds of lawyer, basically. There are probably more, and I'm not a specialist. I know lawyers, but I'm not one. Never have been one. And so the solicitor tends to do all the um, domestic work, the day-to-day preparation. They can appear in courts, I believe, but they do the, the groundwork. They do all the process, and they have to know a lot of things. The barrister tends to be more a theatrical figure, has to know law as well, has to have a legal... They both do a basic law degree and then they split. And it's a very kind of um, uh, privileged and arcane, traditionally it was anyway, um, thing to become a barrister. You have to go and live or at least dine in the inns of court in London with you. I think you have your wig and stuff like that. So I'm talking out of my expertise, so please don't be too cross with me if I'm wrong. But I think that's pretty much right. And um, they present the case and so they are actors uh they are uh rhetoricians Reto- no they they're masters of rhetoric uh in that the art of persuading people using language and not just language but facts and and dramatic effects to persuade the jury of the rightness or wrongness of their case over and above the truth the truth's important, but but certainly their performance in being persuasive talkers, being able to persuade people and being able to move people emotionally um, behind their um, uh, person, their person, their uh, who are their client, that's a word. Anyway, so Edward Par- Palliser was one of these. And so you have your barristers and your top barristers become king's councils, used to be queen's councils. Or silks, because they wear silk, you see. So, uh, and then they can become a judge. Most judges are actually drawn from barristers rather than solicitors. So they're kind of probably considered the elite lawyers. Uh, if there are solicitors listening, they'll be fuming and grinding their teeth. If there are barristers, they'll be, of course, agreeing. Um, in any case, so he's one of those, and he's retired. And I think, interestingly, he lives in a cul-de-sac. So he begins in the cul-de-sac. And it ends in the cul-de-sac. So the cul-de-sac is him retiring from life, both the criminal, his professional life, and, you know, um, comforting himself and uh, uh, amusing himself with his library of criminology. Uh, And that's where we find him, and that's where he goes back to. And the call of um, Magdalena Vaughan, the beautiful and young Magdalena Vaughan. Now, some, of course, people would say, well, do you know what? When he was on that cruise, he was on that ship, and she was, what, 20? Remember, she's 30 now. It was 10 years ago. Uh, So she was 20. And he was uh, approaching 60 at the time. So you you may have thought, oh, dear, that's a bit rum. But I think that's our modern taste, and I think, you know, certainly it was much more common for older men to marry what we would consider much younger women and and again, we get into this criticism of, uh, you know, uh, the temptation to criticise other times and other places and other cultures. And, you know, just let's let it be. It is what it is. It wasn't considered scandalous. That is not a fact that readers 
contemporary readers would have found scandalous, okay? So if you found it scandalous, that is because of your current culture, um, not theirs. That it was not. It is not a feature of the story. She was not intending to shock people, right? Okay, next thing um, is... That, so it's neatly constructed. He has retired from his criminal, but he's also retired. He's a bachelor. He sits and reads his books. He's not interested in chasing women or going out on the town and so she comes and it's kind of like a not wholly welcome siren call to pull him back into real life um and so but he he goes because he has a code of honor and a promise is a promise even though as christy wittily says we say these things but uh, most of the time we're not called on to make them good of if i can do anything but you know of course most of the time we know it's a thing that uh, i was reading um, slavoj zizek the uh, slovenian uh, philosopher and he talks about um it's not him saying this i think lacan says it actually about a performative words are performative a lot of the time, they don't mean what they say. We say the words and they have a formal meaning, but that everybody knows that's not what they mean. I think people, apart from people who struggle with um, autistic spectrum disorder, they can really struggle with that as they tend to take, so well, you said this, but you don't mean it. N no, of course, we all know we don't. Well, we don't all know, but the majority, if you like, it's a numbers game purely, uh, rather than saying one is better than the other, um, they know, we know it's performative. We know this is something you say. When somebody dies, I'm sorry for your loss, if there's anything I can do. Now, we know that is not really... M many people would, if they can help, they will, but it's understood that it will not be called upon. Like when you go out and, oh, how are you today? People don't really want to know. Uh, so words are performative, and this thing he said to the girl on the ship was purely performative. Um, but because it was said, a gentleman's word is his bond, and he is a gentleman, he's very patrician, he's a sir, he's a knight, so presumably he's been knighted, he's, he's, he's either inherited the title or he's been knighted because he was a king's counsel. I don't know if they all get knighted, but I think probably a lot of them do. Um, okay. So he goes out and goes, let's look at the structure of the de detective story. As we have seen in many of these classic detective stories, there are clues given, and in the early ones particularly, there's absolutely no way you could have worked them out as a reader. And as time has gone on up until modern times, it's expected that you should be able to work out who the killer is. I would suggest to you that this was very difficult in this story because um, there... And she's, she's halfway, you know... Certainly Christie was one of the people who moved it towards that position where the reader could work out who'd done it. Whereas I think with Sherlock Holmes, you pretty much can never do that. Somebody will come and correct me. But my impression is that, um, and, and a lot of the early detective fiction is there's just no way the reader could work it out because the, um, the detective has much more knowledge which is not shared with us till the denouement. And there's usually a denouement at the end. There isn't one in this one. Uh, there isn't a scene where he explains his workings out, is there? Um, which is, I think, very common in longer pieces, even for Christie, of course, very famously for Christie. Uh, Hercule Poirot and everybody sits around, gets everybody around and explains and usually then pins it on the criminal there who isn't expecting it. So, right, misdirection. She sets everybody up with a motive, you know. But at the same time, she kind of like... Um, uh, she sets up uh, Magdalena, who is a simple girl, an innocent, really. Um, it, she's innocent because she believes that the uh, Sir Edward Palliser really meant what he said. But also, uh, she just knows it wasn't one of her family of the four of them. And then she innocently gives a, a up them up, really, gives them all a motive, you know. Her Louche, is he Louche? He, he appears loose, and he comes and apologises. I think that's a save the cat thing to make him seem a nicer guy. Um, you know, make the character seem marginally better. But it, w with the brother William, isn't it? And he's a bit, a bit of a... Well, he's, he's lost a lot of money, presumably gambling. I'm going to say something about the idle rich shortly. Uh, and uh, then uh, the, the sister-in-law is ineffectual. She's, she's not resilient. She doesn't cope. Uh, she's dependent on the old woman, but um, he just can't manage life, really. And her husband spends his time with his stamp collection, which is a very worthy 
hobby, but he doesn't appear to do anything else productive. I mean, he's ill and he can't do anything, whatever, whatever, whatever. And of course, then um, Christie then has Martha the maid, and he says, and he and he he, he kind of whitewashes her and says, "Oh, she's an honest woman. She would be a good witness." Yes, but yes, but yeah, she would. So he, he, she's. I think Christie is not cruel to her characters. The only one that comes out a little bit is um, Miss Crabtree, the aunt who comes across as a, a horrid old woman, really penny pinching, pernickety, um, prone to unpleasant and critical thoughts about people. She isn't really a very nice person. She has this one redeeming feature, which is very important for the plot and is is barely believable, to be fair. Uh, I'm not sure that a woman like this, whose husband is a wealth, and doesn't really like and doesn't like to be cheated and doesn't really like it if she, if she really would be um i think you know as such a a donor to the poor the beggars always get something that's really important clearly for the denouement and the actually understanding what happened in the story i'm not convinced that the but the picture she paints of Miss Crabtree. But after saying that, of course, I'm going to correct myself. She is looking after all these these lame duck relatives. So, and she has no need to do that. So maybe I I, I wonder. And forgive me, uh, Dame Agatha. Uh, I wonder um, if she could have kind of just with a little bit of a watercolor wash have painted the Crabtree slightly warmer. Yeah, more human. Um, I, I, the two sides don't totally gel together to me anyway, I said enough of that. So, but, so she misdirects us by giving a motive for all of them, and we're like, aha, 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 all right? And then uh, she uh, leads us along with Martha, and then there are two things that happen. Our man Palace has two insights. The first is that um, that somebody could have called, yeah? unbeknownst to Martha, it wasn't unbeknownst to her actually, but but the point being that Miss Crabtree could have opened the door herself. That's the first insight. Uh, and, and also when he goes upstairs, after that's disclosed, he makes a comment about how you have a good view of the street from the window, from her window. I think it would have been better, excuse me, Dame Agatha, if um, that had been first. Uh, so it wouldn't have been highlighted, but it would have been an aha moment afterwards, yeah? If if that could have set it up better, I think. Excuse me, Dame Agatha. Um, if I just sold a fraction of her billion uh, books, I would be very very happy. Um, so, I think that would have been better. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is the Deus Ex Machina. You know, which is the the res resolution of a plot that the ancient Greeks did in their dramas. They couldn't work it out. It was no working out. And then suddenly they drop a drop a god in the Deus from outside the machine, outside the, the technical goings-on of the play, and he said, oh, it's all all right, boom, you know, and it's considered a, a rickety way of solving a, a dramatic or a, a story problem. But um, ultimately, yeah, the other insight, of course, is the sixpence. Yeah, that was well, very well done. That was very well done. This, she didn't like that. That's just dropped, not highlighted. There's nothing done about it. It's just laying there. Ah, okay, we don't. She she misdirects us away from it, yeah, by some of the other things. She said there's nothing nothing of anything. He says there's nothing in this bag. Mm. And then it so happens that the brother stops him outside the Song of Sixpence, and that's the second insight. Aha, there wasn't a new Sixpence there. That is really well done, I thought. And who am I to say? But, you know, that's what I think. Um, and so then he goes back, confronts Martha, who spills the beans. This is a deus ex machina. Her son, uncounted for, turns up to see her, probably. That's believable. Uh, the, the Miss Crabtree opens the door herself. She's always kind to beggars. She gives him a thing, and his avaricious working-class eyes see the money, and he thinks, I'm going to do this, old bird. And he whacks her on the head. He's been a jailer a couple of times. So, uh, and so that's the final thing I want to say is, of course, Remember that the people who are reading these stories are the are they're not actually probably patricians. Some may read it of the aristocracy, but the bulk are the respectable middle class. And at all times, but particularly then, but all times, they had a tremendous fear of the poor. Going back to Victorian times, then after the First World War, there are these maimed ex-servicemen and people ruined by going to war, and the 
the crash of the twenties economically, um, and uh, they are you know and they're terrified of them, and it's really they really, you know the unemployed are very quickly linked with the criminal. They're they're the same thing, you know, and so I think this is probably it's maybe an unreflected thing that she's doing you know it's just what people thought uh unreflectedly and it's just a stereotype so do you know um if i was of the patrician class i would probably go oh, yes of course of course of course the unemployed and the work shy are thieves and criminals and murderers very very close together but i'm not you see i'm from them so uh you you can't escape your own prejudices i suppose I'm very chippy, you know, I'm very, I'm a chippy oik. Um, so, but anyway, after saying all of that, it was a flawed masterpiece, I think. Um, I think some of the stuff she did was amazing. She was great at plotting. Put the window in a bit early, Agatha, put it a bit earlier. Uh, otherwise, the sixpence I did was great. Um, that little insight that it gives him. Uh, some of the lazy stereotypes about the, I mean, yeah, what I was going to say is, so the unemployed are terrible. What do these lot do? They do now. They just sit around playing with the stamps. None of them are work. They just gamble and lose money. These are the idle rich. There is no virtue in that, surely. Yes, yeah, apart from there. We and non we, isn't it? Us and non us. Uh, as the Midfords would have it. Anyway, so there we are. Good story. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I did. It was very good. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>